Jenna. Yeah, you can just leave that on the table. Yeah, thank you. Um, awesome. Uh, before we get into the sermon, would you pray with me? Uh, God, we thank you for this time and space that we have to study your word together, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would open us up now. Uh, help us to hear the words of love and comfort that you have for us, God, but also open us to the ways that you are pushing us to grow. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, who is the living word. Amen. Uh, well, sometimes in life, sometimes in life, we need help. Um, quick story. So uh, back when I was in college, there was this one day where I went to the gym to get my workout in. And I was doing my workout, and at one point I decided to go do a set on the bench press. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, the bench press is an exercise where it helps if you have a spotter who's working with you, a spotter is somebody who can like monitor and, and step in to help you if you need it. Because uh, in the bench press, you typically have a lot of weight that's right above your chest, which is like your lungs and your heart vital organs, you know, so you don't want anything to, to go wrong. But I was 20 years old. I was feeling confident. I was feeling strong. So I thought, I don't need no stinking spotter. And I went over there and I started loading weight onto the bar in hindsight more weight than I probably should have, and, uh, and I hop on the bench press, right, and I'm, I'm doing my set, and I get to the end, and I think to myself, you know, my arms are tired, but I bet I can squeeze out one more rep. Some of you, maybe you're gym goers, you know that, like, I could do one more, and so I, I lower the bar down to my chest, and I push, and I strained, and I discovered that I could not, in fact, squeeze out one more rep. And now I was in kind of a scary situation because I had this heavy bar on my chest, and every moment that passes, this bar is sinking a little bit deeper into my rib cage. And at that point, I did the only thing that I could do. I swallowed my pride, and I called out for help. And I tried to save some of my pride by not being like, help. I tried to be like, help, you know, like, I. I got this, uh, but I help would be nice. Fortunately for me, there were some like big gym bros around that were a lot stronger than me, and they were able to run over, and, and it was pretty easy for them. But they like they lifted the weight uh, off my chest, so I did not die, thankfully. Uh, but that was a moment that stands out in my life uh, as a time where I was forced to admit I'm not strong enough for this. I can't handle this on my own, and I need help. And I lift that up to us as a metaphor, and maybe you can relate on some level. I don't know if you've ever been stuck on the bench press. Hopefully not. Um, but I bet you know what it's like in life to be stuck under some kind of heavy weight and to come to the realization that I'm not strong enough. I can't do this on my own. I need help. And I don't know what that weight looks like in your life. It could be the weight of uh, mental health struggles, that it's, it's just too much. Uh, it could be financial problems, the debt, the bills, the loans, it's just, it's too much. It could be family problems, relationship problems. Uh, maybe for some of us, it's just the weight of life in general that's too much. Like, I don't know if you can relate to this. I mean, a lot of days, if I'm honest, like just trying to take care of myself and be a functioning adult in society can feel overwhelming. And I know on top of that, uh, many of us are trying to raise kids in this crazy world. Some of you are trying to take care of your aging parents. Some of you, you're trying to be a great owner to your pet. Uh, all of us, we have these to-do lists that just, they're like never ending. This, this weight that bears down upon us. And, and sooner or later, I think most of us come to a place where we realize, I can't do this on my own. I need help. I don't know if that resonates with any of you, but if, if that does, and particularly if you're in a place today where you're feeling that weight and you're feeling like, I need help, I've got good news for you. And the good news is that God knows. God knows that we need help. In fact, God knows that we can't do life without help. God never expects us to do life without help. And so God loves us and God cares about us enough to give us the help that we need. I want to tell you about something really amazing that Jesus said one time, and this is a verse that often gets overlooked, uh, but this is just so powerful and so encouraging. Um, uh, the night before Jesus went to the cross, he was with his disciples, 
And um, he was explaining to them that pretty soon he was no longer going to be present with them physically anymore. And they didn't really understand that at the time. Um, but, but then he went on to say this. Let me show you. Um, he said, but, like as in like, but I'm not going to be around physically anymore. But he says, the helper, who's the helper, Jesus? We have a helper? Yeah. The helper, the Holy Spirit. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. What is Jesus saying? He's saying to the disciples, and by extension, he's saying to us, listen, I know that life can be too much. I know that sometimes it just gets too heavy and you need help, and so I'm going to send you, and God the Father is going to send you this divine helper called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to come alongside of you and give you the help that you need. And so all of this is to say um, we are starting a new sermon series today where we're going to spend the whole month of June talking about this divine helper, this Holy Spirit. And we're going to be thinking together about, okay, how exactly does the Holy Spirit help us? How can we look for the Spirit? How can we expect the Spirit to be helping us in our lives? And to help us think through this, we're going to be looking at several passages from the New Testament book of Acts. Acts. When I say that, I'm saying A-C-T-S, not A-X. That's what you use to chop down a tree. Not A-X-E. That's a body spray for middle school boys. Um, thank you for laughing at that. Just making sure you're awake. No, Acts, it's, it's short for the Acts of the Apostles. This is the book in the New Testament that tells us the story of the early church. And many scholars and many theologians would say that actually that book should have been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a lot of human characters doing things in the story. But actually if you read through it, what you'll see is that the Holy Spirit is the driver. The Holy Spirit is the main character. If you were going to turn the book of Acts into a movie, which would be pretty cool because it's an exciting book, uh, but you would need like a strong lead actress to play the Holy Spirit, like a Meryl Streep or a Viola Davis or, or somebody like that. And because of that, the book of Acts gives us this awesome window to see what is the Holy Spirit doing. And that helps us to see how can we expect the Holy, Holy Spirit to be our helper in our own life. Life. So that's where we're going over the next several weeks. Uh, I hope that if you have ever been in a place where you feel like I need help, and I especially hope if you're in that place right now, that this series is going to be encouraging for you and, and uplifting for you. That's certainly my goal. Anybody feel like they need some divine help in their life? Okay, a few of you. Okay, all right, good, good. I'm not alone. All right, well, that's where we're going. Now, let's turn our attention to the very first way that the Holy Spirit is our helper, at least the first way that we're going to talk about in this series. Um, I'm going to give this to you up front, and then we're going to unpack it together. So the Holy Spirit helps us to find true joy. Somebody say joy. joy. Say it more joyfully. Say joy. <laughs> there you go. Okay. The Holy Spirit helps us to find true joy. Joy. Now, here's something I think I know about you, and I realize I'm looking around the room. Some of you I know better than others, but even if I haven't met you before, I think I know about you that, that you want to live a joyful life, right? I mean, maybe you want to live a life of sadness and negativity, but I kind of doubt it. And my guess would be that you probably want to have more joy in your life than you currently have right now, right? And guess what? God wants that too, God didn't create us for sadness and negativity. God wants us to live a life of joy. But we have a problem, right? The problem is it is really hard to sustain a, a sense of joy through all the ups and downs of life. I hope for each of us that there are at least some sources of joy in our life. But I think what many of us find is that th those experiences of joy tend to be fleeting. They come and they go pretty quickly. It's hard to sustain a sense of joy. And, and why is that? Because we live in this world that has so many different ways of stealing our joy. Like for one thing, all of us have problems in our life, right? If you don't have any problems, this sermon is not for you. I'm sorry. You can come back next week and, and see if it's better. Um, but most of us, I think, would say we got problems at work. We got problems at home. We got problems that as soon as we solve one, a bunch more spring up, you know. Like, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but maybe you got like a big stressful project at work and you finally get that done and finished and you're driving home and the check engine light comes on in your car. And you're like, well, now I got that problem. 
or you find out one of your family members has COVID and you're like, oh, now I got to blow up my life for a couple of weeks trying to figure that out. Or, you know, maybe you have conflict at work and you finally smooth that over with your boss or your coworker or whatever. And then you get home and you end up in a fight or an argument with your partner and then you got to sort that out. It's just like whack-a-mole with all these problems. And that's just personal problems. Like you think about all the problems in the world around us. I mean, we, we turn on the news and there's all these horrible reports about things going on around the world, and there's political division and hate and climate change and all. I mean, it's just, it's endless. So is it any wonder in the face of all of that that we struggle to maintain a sense of joy? And really, like, that's not even the whole story, because on top of us trying to play whack-a-mole dealing with all these problems that keep popping up in our life, we've got all of these voices coming at us all the time that are doing everything they can to try to tear us down. What am I talking about? I'm saying that every single day we have advertisers, all right? These advertisers are, are just screaming at us, hey, you are not attractive enough. You are not successful enough. You better hurry up and buy this car or buy these clothes or buy this makeup or buy this hair product or whatever it is they're selling because as it stands, you are not enough. Those of us on social media, we've got Instagram screaming at us every day. Hey, look, look at these people. They're having a better vacation than you. Look at these other people. They got a better romantic life than you. Look, look at these people who are better moms to their kids than you are to your kids. You are not enough. And I think many of us would say on top of that, we've got voices in our own head. The little voice, you call it the devil, Satan, self-doubt, whatever you want to call it, that little voice that just finds those opportunities to whisper to us, you're an imposter. You don't measure up. You're a failure. If people knew the real you, you would never be loved or accepted or valued. And so with all of these problems, with all of these negative voices, is it any wonder that we struggle to find a sense of joy in our lives? Maybe you felt at some point like, I, I, I should have more joy. What's wrong with me? No, it's not anything wrong with you. Like, look at what we're up against here. And, and so the Holy Spirit knows about us that joy can be a struggle. And like I said, God created us for joy. And so the Holy Spirit comes and gives us the help that we need. Now, we see this playing out in this passage Jenna read for us from Acts chapter 2. Um, this passage takes place on the day of Pentecost. If you were with us a couple of weeks ago, we talked in more detail about Pentecost. Um, but in a nutshell, Pentecost is when the very first disciples received the Holy Spirit for the very first time. If we had more time, I'd want to nuance that a little bit. But that's basically what happens on Pentecost. And we have to understand that on Pentecost, those very first disciples, on paper, they did not have much to be joyful about. These people had problems, big problems, just like you and me. In fact, I would think it's safe to say that a lot of their first century problems were a lot bigger than the problems that we feel today. And they had the same negative voices coming at them as well. We know about these first disciples. They were poor. They were uneducated. They were not particularly talented. And they would be the first to tell you that. They were not successful in the eyes of the world. They never would be successful in the eyes of the world. They were the victims of racism and oppression. On top of that, they had the local authorities who were out to get them. The local authorities wanted to have them arrested and tortured and, and possibly even killed. And so you look at these, these people and you think, like, that there's really no reason for them to be particularly joyful. And yet, and yet what we're told is that when Jesus makes good on this promise to send the helper, the Holy Spirit, one of the things that happens is that these, these early Christians, they're filled with this deep sense of joy. They go out into the world, they start telling people about Jesus, and as they do that, they, they've just got this joy about them that, that people can't help but notice. And a, a lot of folks were, like, confused. Why are these people so joyful? Let me show you this. Right before the passage picks up that we just read, um, Acts tells us this. It says, they, talking about like the observers of these early Christians, uh, they were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? They're like, how can people with so many problems be so joyful? We, we, don't, we don't get it. And then this is kind of funny. Uh, in the next verse, it said, others jeered at them. I'm talking about onlookers to the, to the Christians, right? Others jeered at them saying, these, these Christians, 
they're full of new wine. People were like, well, I know why they're joyful. These Christians have been popping some bottles. Like, the, these people are getting drunk. And, and then our passage picks up where Peter steps forward. He's one of the leaders of the disciples. He steps forward to address uh, all this confusion about why they're so joyful. And what does Peter say? He says, listen, these people are not drunk as you suspect. He says, after all, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not out here getting hammered before breakfast. Come on. Uh, he says, rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And then he quotes from the Old Testament here. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my what? Yeah, I will pour out my spirit, my spirit, my spirit on all people. What's Peter saying? He's saying, you want to know how we can be so joyful in the face of all these problems that we've got? It's because we have this divine helper. We're not under the influence of a substance. We're under the influence of the Spirit. We've got this divine helper who has come into our lives who is helping us to find true joy. And what's interesting, at least to me, is that um, this was not just like a, a one-off occurrence. We're told that throughout the first century, as the Christian faith spread, as the church spread to other parts of the world, this same basic thing would happen everywhere Christians would go. People would look at them and be like, uh, these people got problems. These people face all the same negativity in the world that we face, and yet they're, they're joyful. And people would approach these Christians and be like, what, what do you have to be so joyful about? Have you ever, like this happened to me um, uh, recently, I was uh, checking out at Target and I had kind of had a frustrating day and I was not in a good mood and I was checking out and the cashier was all bubbly and cheerful and like, hey, how's it going? How's your day? You know, and I, I didn't say it out loud, but in my head I was thinking like, what do you got to be so joyful about? You know, that's kind of how people would come at the Christians, like, what's the deal with this? And, and over and over again, these folks would say the same thing that Peter said. They would say, it's not from us, really, it's just we, we've got this, this Holy Spirit, we've got this helper who's helping us to find true joy. Now, a lot of times people would ask a follow-up question, and maybe it's a follow-up question that you're sitting there thinking of right now, and that is like, okay, okay, we hear you crediting the Holy Spirit, but like, how, what is the Spirit saying to you? What, what is the Spirit doing for you that's causing you to be so joyful? And I love how the Apostle Paul speaks to this. Apostle Paul is uh, kind of like Peter, another early church leader. And at one point in the book that we now call Romans, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and listen to what Paul says here. He says, the same Spirit, capital S, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit agrees with our spirit. In our context today, we might say our heart or our soul. The Holy Spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. We are God's children. What's Paul driving at? He's saying the, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, and the Holy Spirit gives us this assurance that we are children of God. Why is that joyful? Well, one of the reasons that, that that's joyful is because it keeps all of our problems in proper perspective, because we know that we have a heavenly Father who is committed to us. Several years ago, I um, was hanging out with a friend of mine, and uh, his daughter was at the age where she was learning how to tie her shoes. And if you've ever helped a child learn how to tie their shoes, like, it can, it can get complicated. And so this child was like, she was struggling with this, and it felt like a big problem. It doesn't seem like a big problem to you, but, but to her, this was an overwhelming problem. And I watched as my friend, her father, stood there by her side. And he didn't just tie her shoes for her and resolve the whole situation, because she needed to learn how to tie her shoes on her own. But he made it clear to her, like, I'm going to sit with you, I'm going to work with you, and we're going to figure this out together. That's what parents do for their children. How much more does God do that for us when we have problems in our lives? You see, we are God's children. That keeps our problems in perspective and allows us to feel joy even in the face of our problems. Th this also is the antidote to those negative voices that come at us, right? Right? Those voices that say, you're not good enough, you don't measure up, you're a loser, you're a failure, you're an imposter. What this tells, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and gives us this assurance, no, 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 we're God's children. We're beloved. So when you hear that voice in your life tearing you down, you can say, no, 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 that's a lie. 
That's a lie. I'm a child of God. And I know that because I have this assurance from the Spirit in my heart. Do you see how that liberates us for joy? Keeping our problems, keeping the negativity in proper perspective. It actually even gets more joyful. The Apostle Paul says in the next verse, he says, But if we are God's children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. That's kind of a mouthful, what is Paul saying? He's saying in addition to giving us this assurance that we are children of God, you know what else the Holy Spirit does? The Spirit gives us this assurance that our future is bright. We, we have a future with God in glory that nothing in this world can take away. And that's joyful. That's joyful, right? Like, um, I was trying to think of a good analogy for this. Uh, so I'm an NC State sports fan. I, I say that in like every sermon probably, so sorry if you're sick of hearing that. But a couple weeks ago, I was watching an NC State baseball game, and it was the ninth inning, so like close to the end of the game, NC State is up uh, like 10 to nothing, right? So it's very clear how this game is going to end. But in the ninth inning, the team that they were playing hits a grand slam. If you're not familiar with baseball, that's four runs, four points that this other team added in the ninth inning. Now, normally, I'd be pretty upset that the other team scored that many points that quickly. But guess what? I wasn't all that upset. You know why? Because I knew how the game was going to end. It didn't really matter. I didn't enjoy seeing the other team score all those points, but I kept it in perspective because it was clear who was going to win the game. Guys, we know who's going to win the game. Do you see how this relates? God wins. We win through Christ. We are going to experience glory with Christ just as the Holy Spirit raised Christ out of his problems, out of his suffering, out of his death. The same Holy Spirit is going to raise us to experience glory with Christ. And there is nothing in this world that can change that. And so you see how this, this assurance from the Spirit, this assurance gives us the, the freedom that we need to find joy in the face of anything in life that we face. Now, let's make this practical, and I promise I'm almost done. But let's make this practical. Um, the challenge for us, if we want to find this true abiding joy, is we have to listen, and I mean really, really listen for the voice of the Spirit. Because what can happen is our problems and the negative voices in this world can drown out the voice of the Spirit. Uh, a, a couple days ago, I was in my kitchen. I was making breakfast, and um, I had my AirPods in. I was listening to a podcast. And at some point, my daughter walked in the room, and she started talking to me. But my back was to her, and I had AirPods in, and I, I didn't even know she was there. And at one point, I turned around, and I saw that she was in the room with me, and I could see her mouth was moving, but I still could not hear what she was trying to tell me. Why? Because I had my AirPods in. And so I had to press pause on the podcast and take the AirPods out of my ear so that I could hear her voice. It's the same with us in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in every room that we walk into. Scripture says the Holy Spirit is in our hearts even as we speak. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to us all the time. But if we don't pause the noise of the world and listen, then it's going to be really hard for us to hear the voice of the Spirit and to find the kind of joy that the Spirit is trying to lead us into. Are you with me? So then the practical question is how can we press pause on the noise of the world so that we can be listening for the voice of the Spirit. You can pat yourself on the back, because one of those ways is something you're doing right now, and that is coming to worship. I always encourage you, don't just come to worship when you feel like it. Don't just come to worship when it's convenient. Come to worship as often as you can, because you get to literally, in some ways, step out of the world into this sacred space and spend this time simply listening to the voice of the Spirit. Uh, you could join a small group. You could join a volunteer team because one of the Spirit's favorite ways to speak to us is through uh, other people speaking into our lives. Let me give you one last way that you can listen to the Spirit. And to me, this is like one of the best ways that you can do this. It might sound challenging, but I want to lift this up for you. That is to read Scripture. To open your Bible and or open the Bible app or however you read Scripture, open Scripture and read at least a little bit every day. And you say, every day, Daniel, my gosh, that sounds like a lot. And maybe it is a lot. But guess what? You got problems every day, don't you? You got negative voices coming at you every day. How are you going to pause and listen to the Spirit and counteract all of that? I would argue you need to listen to the Spirit every day. And reading Scripture is one of the best ways 
to do that. Now, I, I know from pastoral experience and from personal experience, when you first start reading scripture on your own, if that's new to you, it can be a struggle at the beginning. And especially if you're trying to implement this as like a daily habit, it can be a struggle. But I believe in this so much, I want to help you out. I do. And so I'm leading a group this month of people that's going to be reading five minutes a day of scripture, just five minutes a day, and we're going to get together once a week to talk about it. And we're going to talk about what's going well, what's not going well, what are we hearing the Spirit say to us through these Scripture readings. Um, if that sounds like something that you would like to participate in, it's not too late, but I need you to sign up today. You can get on our newsletter. Uh, the link to the newsletter is in the bottom of your digital bulletin. Uh, click on that link, sign up. We'd love to have you in that group, and you can join us in, in practicing listening to the Spirit through Scripture just a little bit. Every day. Now, you might say, well, that's not the step for me. I'm not in that place right now. Okay, but then I would just put that question back to you of, all right, well, then what's your plan for consistently pausing the noise of the world to listen for the Holy Spirit? We've got to do this. We've got to do this if we want to find that true joy that the Spirit is leading us into. Our problems are not going to stop. Hate to break it to you. The negative voices in the world are not going to stop until God's work in this world is done. But by the power of the Spirit, we can truly come to believe that we are children of God as our deepest identity. And we can come to believe truly that we are destined for glory with God. And that means by the power of the Spirit, through anything we face, we can come to find true joy. Let me pray for us. Oh God, um, thank you for who you are. God, thank you that you care so much about us that you don't leave us to struggle through this life alone. Um, God, we thank, we thank you for the reminder that um, we need help. God, we try to deny it sometimes. We try to run from that fact. But God, you, you created us as creatures who would need help. And we thank you that you give us the help that we need. Lord, uh, open us to the ways that you're speaking to us through your Holy Spirit. And particularly in the face of the, the challenges that we have in our lives and in our world, God, help us to hear the voice of the Spirit leading us to the sense of joy that you desire for us. God, we want more joy in our lives, and we chase after all kinds of different things to try to find that joy, and so often it's, it's not sustainable. So give us the joy that, that can only come from you, Lord, uh, and give us the guidance that we need to know how to Press pause on the noise of the world so that we can listen for the voice of your spirit. God, we pray all of this in your name. Amen.